appreciate the opportunity to opportunity to be with you. Thank you for that very helpful prayer. If that prayer is answered, we'll be very thankful. We have a PowerPoint to show you. We're going to start that now. The subject is announced is the Abrahamic promise. We really appreciated the thoughts earlier this morning on this subject. And the Abrahamic promise and the covenant God made with Abraham are fundamental to our understanding of God's plan of the ages. If every Christian understood that there's going to be a blessing of all the families of the earth, what a change it would make in Christian thinking. If they recognize that not only is there the high calling now to be part of that seed of blessing, but then a thousand year kingdom to exercise that blessing for every man, woman, and child who has ever lived, it would surely greatly impact Christian thinking. It directly means that if there are two ages of redemption, then this age for the heavenly calling is very unique, very special, requires special devotion. It requires overcoming patience, diligence, zeal, service. And it means that when we're finished, we have a job to do. And I think that's what much of the Christian world misses. But to us, the Abrahamic promise is vital in this understanding of the plan of the ages. Now, there are five segments for our presentation today that we're going to proceed with. First is to mention the obvious, and that is that this is secured by the ransom. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Second, we're going to talk about the three designations for the seed of Abraham and see how those three different distinct designations have to do with three classes in the divine plan. That is stars, dust, and sand. Then we're going to look at the trip that Abraham made from his homeland in Ur of the Chaldees all the way to the land of promise and the cities he visited and how possibly this journey represents the development of God's plan from the time of the patriarchal age forward. Number four, we're going to look at three mothers. I can't call them three wives, but I can call them three mothers that were, that were mothers of the children that Abraham had and all have spiritual meaning. And lastly, we're going to look at the most important one, and that was Sarah. And we're going to look at her age and see if her age has some meaning in the antitypical pictures. So in the first part of our lesson, that it was secured by the ransom. Now you have before you the famous text, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And this is from Genesis 22, verse 18. Now, I think you know the context for this promise that God gave. Now, in this context, God said in verse 16, because Abraham had just been shown his willingness to offer his own son Isaac. Then in verse 16, God says, by myself have I sworn, saith Jehovah, for because you have done this thing and has not withheld thy son, thine only son, I will bless thee. In blessing, I will bless thee. In multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the seashore. And you, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now, the context, the fact that Abraham had just offered Isaac, but then God, the angel of God, had stayed his hand of course, reminds us of the fact that God is willing to offer his son. And that case, it was not stayed. Jesus did die as our redeemer. Now, after this saving of Isaac, because the picture was made, he was willing, but it need not claim the life of Abraham's direct son. Immediately after that, they saw, they saw a ram caught in the thicket. And so he took that ram and he offered it for a bird offering. Now, this is engaging because, first of all, in the tabernacle sacrifices, very frequently, uh, I'm hearing some feedback, maybe whoever's monitoring can just double check on that. Uh, but in the tabernacle, very frequently, the burnt offering was a ram. Now, what does the burnt offering represent? Now, there's been a variety of opinions on that question. It's not very clear. But I have a suggestion for you. 
there are three offerings in the tabernacle, and they are given in this sequence in Leviticus chapter one through chapter seven, where the tabernacle is set up, and now we have to know what kind of offerings to do. Those three offerings were the burnt offering in sequence, and then a peace offering, and then a sin offering. And I think those three offerings represent for us first the, the ransom that Jesus gave. Now, a burnt offering was very particular. It had to be a male that was offered. It could be of the flock or of the herd, but it had to be a male. Now, do you know any other sacrifice that required it to be a male? Well, you remember the Passover lamb was required to be a male. Now, in the culture of that time, male animals compared to female animals were of a higher rank. You'll see that when you compare Leviticus, the fourth chapter. We won't go there right now. So in other words, if you're going to represent Jesus, our Redeemer, then you pick the highest form of, of animal. And when you look at those three, I think it's telling us the first. Oh, by the way, in Leviticus, the first chapter, it does specify that the burnt offering makes atonement for the offerer. And I think that burnt offering does represent our Lord Jesus fully consumed on the cross as our ransom sacrifice. Now, as a consequence of that, we have peace with God. Now, Paul says something like that. It's in the book of uh, Romans, actually. And this is Romans 4.25. And then into 5.1. Paul says, speaking about Jesus, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. So the ransom now has been applied to us who believe and have come into Christ. Ver chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the peace offering is an offering of devotion and consecration and dedication. Maybe you remember that there was a ram of consecration in the uh, in the consecrating of the priesthood, that was a peace offering. A peace offering is not an offering that makes peace, but an offering that is given predicated upon the peace that you have. So I think by choosing a burnt offering here, representing the ransom, the thought is that that brings us peace. And now we can offer ourselves in devotion. And what happens after we are consecrated? We have a lifetime of being purged from the proclivity towards sin so that our mind is righteous and when we're given that fresh body in glory we will be a righteous holy congregation so that's why that sequence in in leviticus is given first the bird offering the ransom is fundamental that gives us peace we offer ourselves in devotion and then we are purged from sin through our lifetime by the experiences that god gives us more, much more to the sin offering than that. That's very brief. It's not complete. Sorry. Okay. So let's go on a little bit farther to our next portion. And this is the different designations that are the descriptions for the seed of Abraham. Now, in Genesis, the 15th chapter, this is before Isaac was born. Abraham was growing old. And even more to the point, his wife, Sarah, was growing old. And he was a little concerned whether the promise of Abraham that he would have a son would be fulfilled. And so in Genesis 15, 1, uh, Abraham says, excuse me, in verse 2, a Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? Because he's just said, I am your exceeding great reward. Now, Abraham can be understandably a little concerned. The age of bearing children is passing, and yet he has no child. So on this occasion, God affirms to him, oh, he did have a child. He had a child by Hagar, but, but no child yet. Um, excuse me, I'm not even sure of that point yet. But, but Abraham was promised, no, you will have a child of your own body. Verse 3. You have given me no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine ear. Well, that would be his servant, excuse me, not, uh, not Ishmael. That was, that was premature. And he says, no, verse 4, one that comes from your own body will be your heir. And he took him forth and said, look now toward the heaven and tell the stars if you be able to count the number. You notice on this occasion, he didn't say your seed will be like the sand of the earth or like the dust of the earth, sand of the sea, dust of the earth. He said it will be like the stars of heaven when he's talking about Isaac. 
Now you all know when you turn to Galatians, the third chapter, verse 16, that Paul said the seed of Abraham was Christ. And you know that in verse 29, Paul says, and if you be, Abraham, uh, be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? Because you, brethren, are going to be with Christ, raised to glory to bless all the families of the earth. And Isaac represents Christ and you. And therefore, in the fourth chapter of Galatians, Paul says, you, brethren, like Isaac was, are children of the promise. And being a spiritual class, it's appropriate that they are recognized as the stars of heaven. Now, you see on the screen there another reference in Genesis 26, 4. This is after Abraham had passed away. Isaac was now the next heir. And God appeared to Isaac and he said, your seed will be like, and you can guess what kind of description he made. It was the stars of heaven because Isaac is a picture of the spiritual seed of Abraham. Now, when we go to Jacob in Genesis 28, 14, this was an occasion when Jacob was fleeing from Esau, his brother. He'd be away for 20 years. Jacob, in this case, being away from the land of promise represents the nation of Israel. They're going to be away from the land of promise for many years, come back at the end of the gospel age, and they are going to be, have a share in spreading the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant to mankind, but not as the spiritual seed, but as an earthly seed. And so in this case, in Genesis 28, 14, at Bethel, when Jacob had the vision of the ladder and the angels ascending and descending, and we know what John says, John in his gospel records that Jesus said, that's descending and ascending upon the son of man. That is, Jesus would be the communication between heaven and earth. In the fullest picture, that's going to be in the millennial kingdom. That's the vision that Jacob had. And at that time, God told him, your seed will be like the dust of the earth, not heavenly. Jacob as natural Israel would be earthly. It would be as the dust of the earth. And it's interesting to know that when you flip back to Genesis, the 13th chapter, now this is what God told Abraham again, but the subject now is not Isaac, it's the land of Israel. And this is Genesis 13, 15 and 16. All the land which you see, I'll give it to you and to your seed after forever. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth. So where the land is at issue, which is natural Israel, now his seed is the dust of the earth. Now, when you go forward, then you see in Genesis 22, 17, on the occasion of Isaac's uh, being given, tendered for, as an offering, representing the ransom, then the broadest of all hopes the sand of the seashore, representing the whole world of mankind. And in Genesis 32, 12, when Jacob is coming back to the land, prepared as it were, as natural Israel, to at the outset of the kingdom, when the blessings are going to go into the world, now the seed of Abraham again is described as the sand of the seashore. Okay, got to move on quick. The next portion we're going to deal with is Abraham's journey from Ur of the Chaldees all the way to the land of promise. Now you can see it's a long way, relatively speaking. It's about 750 miles from Ur to Haran and about 500 and so miles down to Israel. When you're walking by foot or maybe by donkey, <laughs> it's quite a journey. You know, for us driving in a car, a couple of days we'd be there. So this was a real migration. And Ur of the Chaldees was in a land called Sumer. Now, if you look on Wikipedia or you look on Google and you look for the earliest civilization of the entire world, you see they will say it was the Sumerian civilization, the first one recorded. Now, I'm sure there was a better civilization before the flood, but talking about post-flood, things which archaeologists would have access to was Sumer. Ur was part of that. And I think that Ur represents the early civilization after the flood. Well, that would be in the patriarchal age. And Abraham had to leave that culture, the Sumerian culture and the world as it was, and he had to go to a far land to be made a blessing. So he did, he went with his father Terah up to Haran. And then when his father had died, then he comes into the land of Canaan. But first he stops in Haran. Now, Genesis 12, one, 
re reminds us that when Abraham did come into the land, God had previously said to him, come to a land that I will show you, and then I will make my covenant with you. So it was conditional. This covenant was conditional upon Abraham finally coming into the land. That condition was not satisfied until Abraham had left his father, Terah, and who died in Haran, and then come further southward. I will suggest that that stay in Haran might picture for us the next age after the patriarchal. This represents the Jewish age during which the promise, although made, has, was not yet secured because Jesus had not yet died and provided the blood of redemption to secure this promise. Now we're going to go to the next, uh, the next slide. And here are, is the route in simplified form that Abraham made. He went from Ur, I think representing the patriarchal age, to Haran, the Jewish age, down to Shechem, and then finally down to Bethel. Now you can guess, I might say Shechem is the gospel age and that Bethel is the kingdom. Yes, you would guess right. <laughs> That's what we're suggesting here. Now here's the chart of the ages. Uh, let's see, I move my thing out of the way. Here's the chart of the ages. And you'll find, as mentioned earlier this morning, that the first age in the present evil world is the patriarchal age, and that's where Abraham was. So he had to pull up roots, as it were, and go by faith and launch out. And I believe that represents finally ending up in Haran, the Jewish age. And Haran, there's so much more we could say about this, but you may remember that in the time when Israel's in the land, there were a period of seven judges that were a group by themselves. There are more judges than that, but these seven were a unique group. I su suggest to you in a deeper study for another time that those seven judges rep tie in symbolically to the seven periods of the church that take you through the gospel age. What was the problem with the early church? What was their great afflictor? It was the Jewish church. It was the Jewish authorities who were afflicting the true church. That's why Stephen was stoned. That's why others died. So I think Haran represents that problem. And the first persecution, the first um, aggression the Israelites had under the judges was a man named Kushan Rishathaim from this area, that is from the northern parts. And he afflicted the Israelites, and he was finally delivered by a man named uh, Othniel. And Othniel, I believe, represents the deliverance from the Jewish system by the writings of the Apostle Paul. Now, this gets into a much deeper study. I'm not going to go deeper there. We don't have enough time. But I think this bears out at least some agreement that they stay in the north part here represents the Jewish age. Now you come down to Shechem. And what does Abraham do? Abraham worships and builds an altar there, reminding us that the first part of the gospel age is the altar of Christ. Now Shechem is tied directly into the sacrifice of Christ by another method. You remember that when Jacob came into Shechem many years later on his return to the land, he bought in a parcel of land at Shechem that cost him 100 pieces of silver. Now that's the way it's put in the, gospel, in the book of Genesis. But you find in the margin that that actually is 100 lambs of silver, each piece of silver worth a lamb. Well, 100 is Jesus' number. The gate, the door, the veil, all measure 100 square cubits. And the lamb, of course, is what represents our Lord Jesus as the sacrifice for our sins. And much later, when Joseph and the Israelites, Joseph was dead by that time, but they had brought his bones with them out of Egypt, came into Israel and they came to Shechem, they buried the bones of Joseph there at Shechem in that plot that was purchased for a hundred lambs of silver. Who does Joseph represent but our Lord Jesus? A memorial, as it were, for the sacrifice of our Lord that begins the gospel age. But then Abraham moves on. He moves on to Bethel, and Bethel, I believe, represents the thousand-year kingdom. Now, Bethel is the place where Jacob originally had his vision 
of that ladder ascending to heaven with the angels of God ascending and descending. And that's primary fulfillment. Well, it has a double fulfillment, partly in the gospel age, but the primary fulfillment of that will be in the millennial kingdom. I think tying Bethel right into the millennial kingdom. Now you may say, well, wait a minute, Abraham went elsewhere in the land of Canaan. He did, but not on this occasion. That's all that's mentioned, those four locations. After that, he took a brief visit to Egypt, and then we go on to other narratives. So I think these four locations represent that in the present evil world, there are four ages, and then on to the kingdom. There are four ages unfolding in the divine plan, predicated upon God's covenant with Abraham. Now, one of the discourses today mentioned, yeah, but way back in the garden, there was a promise. Oh, there was. It was a precious promise. But the Abrahamic covenant gave it more root, more, more depth. And so from the flood forward, patriarchal age, Jewish age, gospel age, and kingdom. Very nice connection. Now we're going to go, move on to the three mothers. We don't call them the three wives of Abraham, although I've said that many, many times, but I'm not precise when I say that. Because there were not three wives. As you all know, Hagar was a bondmaid and never a wife. Hagar produced a seed, but it's not to be the promised seed of blessing. That was left for Sarah. And Sarah was, in fact, a full wife. And then after she died, Keturah became a full wife. And that's why we say there were really only two wives involved. Now, we're going to start uh, with, with Hagar because she was the first one to bear a child as one of three mothers. And I think you all are very familiar with the fact that Paul makes the point at the end of Galatians chapter three and into chapter four about the Abrahamic covenant, that this, the natural seed of Hagar, who was a bondwoman, was not the chosen seed for blessing. That Hagar represents the, as a bondwoman, the covenant of bondage, the old Jewish law. And her child, Ishmael, who by the way had 12 tribes descend from him, just like Jacob did. So those 12 represent the 12 tribes of the natural seed of Israel. That's like the dust. And that's during the Jewish age, which did bear fruitage during the Jewish age, but not to produce the chosen seed of blessing. They'll be a helper class. They will be inducted as the seed of Abraham during the kingdom. And then as an earthly class, they will help bless mankind as an agency during the earthly kingdom. But from Sarah came Isaac, the true seed of blessing. And she's the one that represents our mother. Now, what is that mother covenant that Sarah represents? Well, may I suggest, I know there's been different opinions on this from time to time. We'll get to those opinions just in a moment. But I think that Sarah represents the covenant that was given to her husband. And that is the Abrahamic covenant. And chiefly the Abrahamic covenant said, the seed of blessing is going to come to bless all. That would be Christ in the church. And so you brethren, and I hope myself, are children of Sarah in this spiritual sense, part of the star class. But now we move on to Keturah. Now Paul does not mention Keturah. And I know that the identification of Keturah is therefore not as clear as Hagar and Sarah. But Keturah was a full wife of Abraham. For this reason, she seems meaningful. And may I suggest that if Sarah represents the spiritual part of the Abrahamic covenant, that Keturah represents the earthly part of the Abrahamic covenant. I think both of these wives both wives of Abraham represent the two phases of the promise to Abraham, the heavenly and the earthly. Now, many years ago, Brother Carl Hackensick suggested to me a thought that I didn't pick up on for a while, but I think he's right. And that is the Keturah's six sons representing the world of mankind born during the 6,000 years of sin and death may have been born before she was a wife of Abraham. That was a new thought to me at the time. That's why I resisted it. That's the way minds are, you know, sometimes. <laughs> but when you think about it a little deeper, it's probably likely there is a scripture on this point 
it's uh, First Corinthians, excuse me, First Chronicles. Oh, well, you got that mixed up. First Chronicles, uh, the fifth chapter. Let me see, where in my notes I have this? First Chronicles 1, 32. It says, now the sons of Keturah, Abraham's concubine. So before she was a wife, she was a concubine. Well, before she was a wife, she, Sarah was living, she was the wife. So I suggest that these six sons were born before Keturah became a full wife of Abraham. Now, I think that that's true. And I think what that means is that once the Sarah covenant is gone, once the heavenly calling has been completed, once that covenant fades from the scene, once we get into the millennial kingdom of Christ, we come into the earthly part of the covenant with Abraham, but the children have already been born. That is, the world of mankind has already been generated. Those six sons represent the 6,000 years of labor under sin that has passed. Now they're going to be blessed. Their status is going to be elevated just like mankind and their status is going to be elevated during the millennial kingdom and blessed. So I think perhaps that's the point of the three mothers. Now, always more to say and always too little time to say it. So let's see, should we go on to another point here? I will just add this point. Uh, that leaves the open question, what about the new covenant? You know, that's where all the difference has been for so many years. May I just make a suggestion? There is one viewpoint that says that Sarah represents the new covenant. There's another point of view that says Keturah represents the new covenant. Uh, may I suggest that maybe, maybe both camps of thought have some credibility here, and maybe the solution is a little different. Maybe the solution is that, that the new covenant is not represented in these analogies, but that the Abrahamic covenant is by the wives of Abraham. And of course, the only bond woman involved is Hagar, she's got to be the law. So there you've got it, the law covenant, the spiritual part of the Abrahamic and the earthly part. So where does the new covenant come in? Well, may I just suggest in passing, when Jeremiah talks about that covenant, it does not say someday I'm going to make the new covenant. What it says is someday I'm going to make a new covenant. It's not the title, it's a descriptor. So what did happen as a consequence of that promise? Well, I think that if you look in how Paul handles this in Galatians and Hebrews, you'll find that Paul actually says we are blessed, not under the old covenant, but by a new arrangement that brings us justification. And I think that same new arrangement is going to apply to the world of mankind and the kingdom in a second application. So I actually think that that fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy applies now as an addendum to the Abrahamic covenant. That is, we need something. Jesus didn't need that as a child of the Abrahamic covenant. He didn't need an addendum giving him redemption, but we do. So I think that's an addendum to the covenant and that it will be an addendum here as well to the Abrahamic covenant for the world of mankind. Now, just in passing again, just Galatians, I want to just make a point. Galatians of the third chapter, verse 15 says, no man adds to a covenant that has been made. And four verses later, he says, a covenant has been added to the Abrahamic covenant. <laughs> okay, that really threw us when we went through those verses. If you look carefully, those two words added are very different in Strong's Concordance. One means a change. Nobody changes a covenant. But the other means something else laid on the table in addition. And that's what happened with the Abrahamic covenant. He put the law covenant on the table as kind of a separate feature. It didn't modify the Abrahamic. And may I say the new covenant does not modify the Abrahamic either. It merely adds features that we need. Redemption, instruction, writing the law of God in our hearts. Those kind of things. Okay, got to move on. Sorry. We're going to talk about the age of Sarah as 127. Now, you all know that Sarah represents something about the spiritual seed. Her child, Isaac, was the stars of heaven. She's the only woman in the entire Old Testament whose age is given at her death date. Now, I say, I've said that several times, 
And I've told people if I'm wrong, call it to my intention. Nobody has, so I'm deducing that this is still correct. That Sarah is the only woman in the Old Testament whose death age we know. As such, could it be perhaps meaningful? Well, I think so. I think in that 127, which by the way is a prime number, you can't break it down, that you have to therefore look at the digits, 12 tens and seven ones. And I think that those 12 represent the 12 tribes of spiritual Israel in Revelation chapter seven. And the seven, the seven stages of the spiritual church, both numbers that pertain to the spiritual seed that do not pertain to the natural seed. So I will suggest her number is very meaningful. Where do you find that number anywhere else in the Old Testament? One time, you find it with respect to Queen Esther, who is a picture of the bride class. That's the whole point about Esther. Vashti, the Jewish class, they were set aside because they, were un they would not show their beauty of character when called upon. And now Esther replaces her prepared with oil and with spices, the oil of the Holy Spirit, the spices of the influence of the, of the fruits of the Spirit. And it turns out that her husband ruled over 127 provinces. Now, in this case, that number is attached to Jesus, Ahasuerus, the husband of Esther. Sarah, the spiritual covenant is 127. That's the covenant that was, you know, the Abrahamic covenant. So in neither case does it directly apply to the bride, but in both cases, it's tangent to the bride. And I think it relates to the church developed through the gospel age. Now there's one more 127, and that's in the experience of Noah. Did you know how long the flood took? If you add the six days that, it, that, that Noah spent on the ark before the rain began, if you add the 150 days that the flood endured before they came to ground at the end of the flood, if you add the next 74 days before they took, saw the top of the mountains off in the distance, if you add the next 95 days before they looked out and saw the flood waters dry, and if you add the next 56 days that they spent in the ark waiting for the mud to dry, <laughs> the whole experience added up to. 127, 127, 127. I can't help but think that that's meaningful. Now I'm inclined to look for meaning in numbers. So maybe when you look at the number and it's 381, you would look no further, but it is three times 127. And what we do have, of course, is three ages involved, the Jewish age, the gospel age, and the millennial age in the fulfillment of these promises. So I think, I think that that is suggesting the three ages involved perhaps in the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, if you like that, very good. Uh, here it is, here's it all laid out. Oh, those are all the days, taking you right to the time they exited the ark, they got in the ark to the exit of the ark, and it's exactly that period of time. Now I'm gonna go on just a little further with this. Do you see that 600 years at the very end? I suggest that that's a little picture of 6,000 years that comes to an end at the opening of the millennial kingdom of Christ. Now, if that 56 years represents the millennial kingdom, first you have to answer what does 56 have to do with the kingdom age? But for just a moment, hold that in advance. 600 years, could that be a little picture of the 6,000 years of sin and death? And at the end of 6,000 years of sin and death, this was Noah's age, by the way, at the end of that time, when they, they, they saw the flood waters dry. If the flood waters are the curse that destroys the world, when those flood waters are dry, there's the ransom being applied for the kingdom to alleviate that curse. Now the water, the land is still muddy out there. The influence of sin and death is still there. Mankind still has to reside in the ark for a period of time. They're not just free, but they've been redeemed. The curse is gone. And now they're waiting for the mud to dry, the effects of sin to dissipate. And finally they get out and re rejoice and give thanks and the world of mankind is free and done. 56, seven times eight, seven times eight. You remember Micah 5, five at the opening of the kingdom, seven kings and eight princes will deliver Israel at the outset of the kingdom, the seven stages of the church and the ancient worthies, the eight that follows the seven stages of the church. 
those two numbers have long been intricately involved with the church and the ancient worthies. And I think this suggests their influence during the, during the kingdom. And that perhaps explains that number. Now then you're gonna ask, well, what about all these other numbers? Okay, I don't know if time will allow me, but yeah, I have an opinion on all those. I think they're all meaningful. I'll go through at least part of them and we'll see how time goes here. Six days here, I think representing the period of sin and imperfection that leads to the redemption at the cross. And now Jesus dies for us. And as Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 20, if you get into the ark, you're saved. The, the, the ark represents baptism into Christ. You can't get into Christ until 30 AD, 33 AD when he died. 40 days of rain later, a day for a year, 73 AD, the end of the Jewish revolt, when finally the judgment is complete upon the Jewish system. Five months, five, a picture of the new creation, taking us through the gospel age until the end of the age. Now I could put a date on that. You probably know the date I would put on that. That date might be variable. Some of our listeners would have different opinions one way or the other. Let me just affirm this. Every one of us recognizes, as many in Christendom do, that we today are at the end of the age. The kingdom is at the doorstep. So when, what evidence is there that we're at the end of the age? I would say Israel is back in their land. We understand the truth again. And the time of trouble from World War I and World War II has inundated us. Now, if you start that, as it often is, 40, day, 40 years before World War I, and you go 74 days, a day for a year further, what you get to is 1948, when the top of the mountains appeared. That is, as Micah says, Israel will be established in the top of the mountains and gradually become the kingdom and the nations will flow unto it. We're not at the kingdom yet. We're not there yet. But we have seen the first visible sign that that kingdom is near. We've seen Israel established in the top of the mountains. And if you go 95 days from there, where will you get? You will get to what I think is the beginning of Christ's millennial kingdom. Now we've got all of this charted out for you and I'm gonna skip by those because our time has lapsed and I have to go to the summary. So I'm gonna go right to the summary. And here are the five points that we've talked about. Number one, the promised Abrahamic covenant, the oath bound covenant is secured by the ransom that our Lord gave on Calvary's cross. That's fundamental. And that's why the oath was given on the occasion of the offering of Isaac. Secondly, the description of the seed of Abraham, stars, dust, and sand, I think probably is not random. I think we have here the heavenly class, that would be you, brethren, the earthly foundation of the kingdom, the nation of Israel, and finally, all the sand of the seashore during the millennial kingdom to be blessed. A suggestion, an interpretive one, a suggestion that perhaps the four locations mentioned in Abraham's journey, Ur, Haran, Shechem, and Bethel, represent for us the four ages involved, the patriarchal age in which Abraham began, the Jewish age, the gospel age, and the millennial age, which will finally accomplish all that was promised. The three mothers, Sarah, the spiritual part of the Abrahamic covenant, Keturah, the earthly part of the Abrahamic covenant, the bondmaid, the old Jewish law. These metaphors do not talk about the next covenant. So we'll leave that in advance, but we've given some thoughts on that. And finally, a suggestion that Sarah's age as the representing the covenant made with her husband, Abraham, is not coincidental. It's not random that it means intrinsically the development of the spiritual phase of Christ's kingdom. That's where you come in, brethren. Every one of you are in running for that spiritual prize in order to help uplift the world of mankind that has been in need for 6,000 years. And you will have the pleasure of bringing them back to godliness, to health, 
and to everlasting life. It's a prize worthy of seeking because it's a prize with a job. All of you and myself hope to be qualified for that job. God be with you all. And Brother Rice, could you do a, give us a closing prayer, please? Our loving Heavenly Father, we are thankful to thee for such a rich promise and such a rich prospect and such a rich calling. We thank thee that our eyes have been opened so that we can participate in this program, that we can, together with Christ, offer our little all and actually be accepted as part of the body of Christ to bring a blessing to everyone who has ever lived. We thank thee for that honor, too great for us. We can't deserve it, but we thank thee for thy mercy. We ask thy blessing as we endeavor day by day to fulfill the requirements of that calling. We thank thee for your mercy and grace and forgiveness. We ask now thy blessing upon our fellowship together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, Brother Rice. It's always very stimulating to hear you talk. Give us a lot to think about. Okay, that's uh, the end of the program for today. We'll, uh, we'll keep the site open, I guess, for another half hour or so for anyone who wants to do fellowship. But then, you know, we have to let, uh, it's late there in Greece, but we have to let Brother Gus go <laughs> so he can be arrested for tomorrow. So thank you well, very I much. I just wanted to thank Brother David Rice for his presentation. It was very exciting. Brother David. And thank you. Brother Daniel, thank you, Brother Todd. You're very kind. Thank you. Brother Daniel, go ahead. Yes, I enjoyed your, your thoughts very much. They're, they're very provocative, uh, give us a lot to think about. Uh, I do want to go back just a, a, a bit to the discussion about the covenants. Sure. Um, as you know, we, we have this difference of opinion, uh, many of us have. Um, Recently, I, I had a, a well, well, brother Dan. Can I stop you there just one moment? I'm not so sure that's the case. Do we? You can go <laughs> ahead and talk. I'm going to listen, but I'm not so sure we have a difference. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I asked a brother recently, uh, uh, you know, who felt that we were that the church the church was not under the new covenant, and so I inquired of him. He, he, I uh, regard the uh, account in Hebrews chapter 9, where Paul says, that he, he talks about in verses 29 and 30, how much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him? So I said, what covenant is Paul talking about? Well, he said it's it's Jesus' covenant, and you know <laughs> this is fine. So to me, I I didn't understand how he would agree that it is Jesus' covenant. And you know, interesting, when we talk about these covenants all the time. We don't talk about the covenant that our Lord made, and isn't that the critical one for all of us? Uh, is that a question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, very engaging. Uh, tell me, when you say the, the Jesus covenant, what, what do you, can you put a name to that covenant so I understand well, your well, point? He called it the new covenant, didn't he? He said oh, it. Oh, 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 okay, I thought you were going. I have no problem. Brother Dan, I actually think your answer on that is correct. See what I told you? We might not have a difference here. <laughs> but let, but let, me, let me probe this a little further. Because I actually think whenever there have been differences for a long time by a lot of very studied brethren, that it's usually because each side has something true. They know they do. They're not going to let go of it. So the question is, is there a way to appreciate the truth on both sides? Now, let me take this out of the present time for a moment. Let's take it about only the kingdom. During the thousand year kingdom, let me ask you this question. See what you answer. What covenant will the world of mankind be under during the millennial kingdom? The covenant of Jeremiah that Jeremiah promised, it was promises, the new covenant. Okay. It, it, okay, Dan, I expected that answer. I think all the brethren give that answer, but I wouldn't. I'll tell you why. Because I think when you say 
under a covenant, you have to ask, first of all, since that's not a scriptural word, what do you mean? And what I would mean by it is, under which mother are you raised? Now, in the kingdom, I think that mother would be Keturah. But what does Keturah represent? I think Keturah represents the earthly part of the Abrahamic covenant. So I would say the world of mankind is going to be under the Abrahamic covenant, the earthly part. That is, all the sand of the seashore will be blessed under that covenant. Now, we all know that that promise is going to apply to mankind in the kingdom. But for some reason, we're, we're don't, not so often that we use that expression. So I think the world of mankind will be under the earthly part of the Abrahamic covenant. So now we should switch that a little bit. What about the new covenant? Well, I think the new covenant is an added feature that mankind is going to need. They need more than just the oath bound promise that there will be a blessing. They also need a means for attaining that. They need redemption. And that's what the blood of the covenant gives them. And I think you're right, Brother Dan, that when Paul mentions the blood of the covenant, he means the covenant of Jeremiah 31. He means the covenant that Jesus spoke about at the Last Supper. This is my blood of the new covenant. I think you're exactly right, Dan. But I don't think, I wouldn't say that the world would be under the new covenant. What I would say is they will be under the earthly part of the Abrahamic and this additional feature of redemption is laid on the table as a supplementary arrangement to bring them out of condemnation. Now, for a moment, while you're thinking about that, let me now flip the coin over to the gospel age. I think exactly the same thing applies. What does Sarah represent? I think Sarah is the spiritual part of the Abrahamic. That, that is the covenant we're really under. That's our mother. A mother raises a child under her care. But what else is on the table? There is something else on the table. Because the promises of being overcomer spiritually isn't enough. We need redemption. And that is the blood of redemption in the new covenant. So I actually think that we are appreciating the benefits of that covenant, that is redemption in this age, there will be another fulfillment of that in the kingdom age. But when it comes to the expression, under which covenant are you raised? I would say a child is raised under the mother and that in both cases, that's the Abrahamic covenant. So I actually agree with you, Dan, that the new covenant actually has a fulfillment now and a fulfillment in the kingdom. Uh, so I, I actually think this is a way to bridge the divide. And maybe all parties can see maybe that's really brings both historic elements into, into sympathy with each other. Okay, I talk a lot, Dan, you know that. Let me be quiet and listen to you. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate your, your input there and your, uh, your viewpoint on that, uh, David. But the thing that most of the, uh, you know, I've been associated with the Bible students for, you know, many, many years. And of course, the, the thought that, that was expressed and continues to be expressed is that the members of the church, the candidates for the church, are not, they're not under the new covenant yet, that uh, Brother Russell took them out from under that and said that they were under a covenant by sacrifice. And they quote Psalms. Well, the problem that I've asked is how does how is Jesus' blood applied to them, you know, if they're not under his covenant? And of course, they don't seem to give me a good answer for that. To me, once Jesus applies his blood on our behalf, then we can make a covenant by sacrifice, but we can't our, we can't make that covenant without his blood, that, that's my view on it. So you and I both agree that we're under his blood and that that's the blood of Jeremiah's covenant. Is that right? Uh, yes, and it's also to me, how many covenants did our Lord enter into? I think only the one that I'm aware of, the new covenant. Oh, well, okay, now let's, let's talk about that. Uh, the new covenant can't go into force until there's the blood of the covenant to seal the covenant, is that right? Right. So the, the new covenant could not go into force until Jesus was dead. Is that right? Amen. So Jesus was never a recipient or a benefactor of that covenant. He was a provider of it. Right. So he was never under any covenant called new covenant. He had no need 
for the law of God to be put in. It was always there. He had no need for redemption. He was always clean. He had no need for information about Jehovah so they all will know me. He always knew him. We need that. The world of mankind needs that. So I think we're on track together. But if I was to ask, answer the question, what covenant was Jesus under? I would say- Under may mother, not be the right word. Well, I, 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 I don't, I, 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 yeah, I don't mind. But I would say he is under the tutelage of his mother and his mother is Sarah. And he was developed as, as a child of the Abrahamic covenant. I mean, all of us agree that Abraham was the promised seed of, uh, excuse me, that Jesus was the promised seed of Abraham. Yes. So, so I think, I think brother Dan, actually we're, we might just be at agreement. We just might be. <laughs> <laughs> much, much of it becomes language. There's no question about that. Yeah. Part of it does. Here's the big difference, brother Dan, the traditional view has said, has always been about Keturah uh, and where the new covenant was applied. One view says Sarah is the new covenant. The other view says Keturah is the new covenant. Maybe the, maybe the surprise answer is neither of the above. <laughs> that, that both Sarah and Keturah are actually the Abrahamic covenant in its two parts. And that the new covenant is really a supplementary arrangement added to both ages for our redemption, our instruction, and our cleansing. That, that will solve all the problems. <laughs> all the problems. See, already oh. Lynette is smiling. See how good that is? <laughs> Of course, she's always smiling. <laughs> okay, just a suggestion anyway. Anyway, think about it, Brother Dan. Tell me why it's wrong later on. <laughs> There's a couple more questions. Yes, Brother Gus. I'm sorry, I saw a hand, but Gus, I, don't, I didn't see anybody else's. Go ahead. Uh, Brother David? Uh, oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, hey, this is Brother Terry Meyer calling. Oh, hi, Terry. And, uh, I just, <clears throat> excuse me, I just really uh, appreciated those last few points that you made with Brother Dan about the uh, Sarah feature of the Abrahamic Covenant and the Keturah and, and the uh, New Covenant. I, that, that does tie everything up into a neat package for me also. I, I also really appreciated, uh, I appreciated all of your thoughts, but I, I really appreciated uh, the four stopping points of Abraham and how they pictured the four different ages. I thought that was very interesting, and I'll, I'll have to give that some study. What, what I really wanted to mention uh, quickly here, and there is a question attached to it, is something that Sister Donna, my study partner, and I were studying this week, and we were actually studying uh, Genesis, uh, parts of Genesis 12 through 19, and studying about Isaac and Abraham and Sarah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase something out of the King James here, chapter 18 in Genesis, beginning with the 10th verse. And this is when the three angels came to Abraham and Sarah. And... Abraham was told that Sarah would have a son, and Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. So, so this, this message that she would have a son was given to Abraham, but she was standing in the tent door and listening and overheard it. And then in verse 12, it says, Sarah laughed within herself. Now, that's really interesting. When, where it, when it says she laughed within herself, that actually means she did not laugh outwardly, but she laughed inside within herself, saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my, my Lord being old also? She was, so she was laughing inwardly, saying, hey, I was barren to begin with, and now, uh, you know, I'm being told that I'm going to have a son. And, and so in verse 13, the Lord responds and says to, Eric, to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Is, verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? And then Sarah says, I didn't laugh. And the Lord says, but you did laugh. 
<laughs> yes. Do you get it? Well, she was caught. Yeah, she did laugh. But you know, Carl Hagensick mentioned something to me years ago about this. And he, he suggested that Seraph's laughter really was more in delight than in derision. I mean, what did she no, say? I'm being old and, and, now, and now finally I'm going to get this promise. And I think she was, and you know, her child was named laughter. That's what Isaac means. Yeah, that's what Isaac means. It means laughter, yeah. happiness. But, yeah, happiness, but yeah. God listened to her inward thoughts and he, and he responded to her and she was fearful. Uh, it says that she was afraid and she denied that she laughed to the Heavenly Father. And then he says, no, you did laugh because he heard her inward thoughts and he was calling her on it when she denied that she didn't, when she denied that she laughed and he said, yeah. you did laugh. Yeah, and, very, very, and very he was, he, he was just, he, he did it in such a nice way uh, that I really appreciated it. It shows he was sparring with her a little bit. And, yes. and we also, I won't go into it now, but if you turn to the previous chapter in Genesis 17, and it starts with the uh, 17th through the 19th verse, he has a similar conversation with Abraham. Abraham fell down laughing, and Abraham said within his heart, uh, you know, but God addresses that thought that Abraham had in his thought, and he also made a statement outwardly about uh, uh, about Ishmael uh, and said, oh, that Ishmael might live forever before thee. God yeah. addressed both of those. The thought that, that the thing that Abraham said outwardly and what he had within his heart, just as he did with Sarah. So, you know, they both, felt, they both laughed and Isaac's as you pointed out, Isaac's name is Laughter. So anyway, I thought you might enjoy that little thought. And thank you so much for all your service and, and how great God is. You know, his, his understanding and his ways are so past us searching out and understanding. Amen. Thank you, Brother oh. Terry. Always nice to hear from you. Lord bless. There was some, uh, Brother, uh, I don't know all the hands. Gus, you know the order, but I see one where Jeff has had his hand up. Go ahead. Sure, I was going to say something, but I, I feel that it, it, there is not enough time for us to discuss this. So, Jeff, why don't you uh, take the uh, lead here? <laughs> okay. I think I can make mine briefer, at least than normal. All right. So, I have a kind of middle ground viewed also, um, but I think I come at it a little different direction maybe than Brother David does. So, my thought is number one, in, in just kind of reduce it down to three scriptures or three scriptural passages. Number one, in 2 Corinthians chapters 3 to 5, is the discussion about this new covenant. And it calls us it, it, ambassadors for this covenant uh, and ministers of it. So, and, and when you read the context, especially if you read it in, in some of the translations aren't really clear, but some translations, it connects, it connects the church not to people under the covenant, but to the people who mediate the covenant. But they're still representatives of that covenant. The second passage is 2 Timothy chapter 5 and 6. Uh, 1 Timothy chapters 5 and 6. 1, chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 5 and 6, where it says Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. So the new covenant has a mediator. The third passage is Galatians get the exact verses here. It's later in Galatians chapter 3, you know, starting about verses 19, 20, 21, where it says that, um, that a covenant is not made with one. Um, it's a, two sides. That's uh, a work covenant, okay? The, the law, if you read, let me start over again. Galatians 3 is about the contrast between the law and faith. And, and Paul is trying to convince the Galatians that they don't receive Christ by practicing the law. They receive it by, uh, by faith. And his point later in the chapter is we don't have a mediator in the Abrahamic covenant. 
That's why we know it's a promise. The, media, the Abrahamic covenant is, is strictly, I'm going to do this for you. You don't have to do anything. Obviously, we have to live a life that reflects that, but it comes by promise. It doesn't come by like the law does by having to do actions. So, so we don't have a mediator. The new covenant has a mediator. And in 2 Corinthians, I think the suggestion is the way we're connected to the new covenant is not being by being under the covenant, but by being ambassadors and representatives of it. So that's my thought anyhow. So Okay, thank you, Brother Jeff. I, I'd like to chat with you more about that, but, but another time. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Brother Gus, please go ahead. L let me hear what you've got. I, I wasn't sure, Gus, whether you were merely moderating or whether you had a point. I, that's why I missed you. Go ahead, please. I'd like no, to hear no, you. It, it's okay. Um, it, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, the language that's being uh, used that maybe it's new to me. So that, that may be part of my confusion. But uh, if I understand correctly, when you refer to an earthly covenant, you're referring to what? Well, I actually, when I talk about the Abrahamic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant promises a blessing both as the stars and as the sand. That's heavenly and earthly. So that will apply to the church now and the world and the kingdom. So because of that, I sometimes say the spiritual part of the covenant and the earthly part of the covenant. That is, the Abrahamic covenant is going to bless us now and the gospel aid spiritually, give us a heavenly life. And in the kingdom, it's going to bless the world and mankind in an earthly way. That's all I mean. Uh, if there's some other language could say the same thing, no problem. I would use another language, but that's what I intended. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, th that's fine. I, th I think I, I, if I understood, you mentioned somehow that the, the work of restoration, uh, as you referred to the millennial age after Christ returns, that that work is, who is performing that work other than the church? Christ and the church. Okay, and so how, that is- how, that's However, right. th there will be more too. You have the great company beyond the veil. You have natural, you have the ancient worthies down here on this side, and they will be kind of leading natural Israel, who will kind of be a light to the world. So I think you've got multi layers here involved. And you have some of them are heavenly and some are earthly. Ancient worthies will be earthly, but that they'll be part of it. Okay. So when you say, and forgive me, maybe I'm, I'm, when you say natural Israel on earth, you're, you're referring to, to the ancient worthies and Israel are different as far as category? I think so, because the ancient worthies are a body of people that have demonstrated their faith before their death. And, and, and some of them were not even Israelites. There was Abel and others that were in Noah. Uh, even Abraham wasn't an Israelite, you know. So, uh, but but to natural Israel, there were promises given as the seed of Jacob, and one is that they would be a nation on earth established in their land from which the blessings of God would flow. You find that in Micah the fourth chapter. It shall come to pass that the law shall go forth from Jerusalem, the word of the Lord from Zion, or maybe I mix those two. But Jerusalem <laughs> is going to be a is going to be the source for the, uh, the agency, the vehicle, the tube, the, the distribution channel, as it were. And I think the ancient worthies are going to be the directors of Israel. Israel, meanwhile, has to be, they have to be converted before they could ever be this. And you find that in Zechariah 12, 12, there will be a national mourning in Israel, weeping for him whom they pierced. And it talks about the weeping, the family of this family and that family weeping apart. And then national Israel will be under the administration of the ancient worthies and prepared to really help the world. I think you need a nation. You need a number of people. You need an organized body to really start distributing benefits, teaching, instruction, help to the world of mankind, more than just the ancient worthies. But the ancient worthies are the directors of this. I'm sorry, go ahead, Gus. Sure. So, so just so just two points. Uh, putting the, the ancient worthies aside, the natural Israel, uh, as I have as I have encountered Scripture as Israel being a type for the church, I think establishing a another Israel, a fleshly Israel, it's fragmenting that promise as Israel being a picture. You know, heavenly Jerusalem, heavenly 
Israel and what they accomplish as a type in the Old Testament as what's going to take place in the future. And then this idea, at least for, for each and every one of us who have gotten to know Christ, it's a process that takes quite a bit of work to take us from where we were to where he's preparing us to be to serve him, right? And to serve all of mankind in the millennial age, uh, that, that somehow there's that the scope of his, I guess, mentorship and his transforming into this new creation is for the service of the people on earth, right? To, to restore, to reconcile, to some extent, the work of reconciliation that's given to us, that uh, how, how it, like Israel today, so to speak, there are, uh, they don't know of Christ, right? They haven't received his spirit. They're not under his, uh, as each of us are, being molded into the image of Christ. And that lifelong process that, that is required to equip us with the work that is in store how that takes place post the resurrection after Christ takes his church is something I, 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 I haven't, I haven't uh, heard before that. that oh, well, that Brother Gus, I think you raise a good point. The Israelites, the Jewish people are going to have to learn obedience, be trained, developed, and learn the kingdom principles just like everybody else, no question. But I think they will, they will, be, they will be, let's put it this way, cooperative under the ancient worthies to begin you know, as a vehicle for the ancient worthies to direct the, the matters through. But, you know, you have this text in Genesis 13, that the land that Abraham was promised is going to be forever given to his seed. Well, that, that won't refer to, uh, you know, the, the, um, the Japhethites. I'm one of those. <laughs> you know, it won't refer to the African brethren that I deal with all the time. It'll revert to the Israelites. They'll have that land. So I think that's that's a very temporal blessing, but it's a it's it's a it's a promise. Your seed will have this land forever. Can I ask a question on that one? Yes, Brother John, go ahead. If that's if that's the case, uh, I, I'm I'm not disputing it. I'm thinking, yeah. You know, as 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 you, then there are going to be. I was led to believe. I've always been led to believe that there was no calling to the earth. There's only a calling to heaven. There's no promise to the earth. Man was created to live on earth, and this is his natural home. All men were created equal. But from what you're saying now, if Israel are taken back to a promised land, then they're not equal. They are being, they're being segregated by God as a, as a promised nation. If the ancient worthies, and I don't take anything away from them, because of their faith, uh, put on a pedestal, then they are not equal. And so all men are not equal. And then what stops, as in the Garden of Eden, where Satan, I believe Satan looked and thought, why was I not the firstborn? Why was it this, 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 the son of God, the firstborn, why was it not me? And so we went wayward. What stops the people of the earth then from going, well, and come, hang on God, how come I wasn't born when Abraham was born? How come I was not born in Israel and I've not been given a promised land? That then gives way to um, people starting to be jealous, people starting to be envious, people starting to want to be something else. And I believe that all men, like I've always believed there's no calling to the earth that is a natural place. Christ and his bride, which when you have a husband and his bride, they bring forth life. And Christ and his bride will bring forth life to all the people of the earth. And those people of the earth will all be equal. There will be no hierarchies of, of, of land given. The people of the earth, they all own the land. Okay, thank you, Brother John. Uh, certainly, it's going to end up that way, isn't it? Everybody is going to have everlasting life and yep. an equal claim. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Yeah, Brother there's David. A, there's yes. a hand by. Yeah, oh, I, I 
understand where the brother, Brother Appleton, is coming from, but uh, if we look at God's arrangement, uh, certainly the, for example, the bride of Christ is going to be much higher than the rest of, of mankind and even higher than the angels. So there is an order in God's creatures. He is uh, a God of, of order and, and uh, so, it, it, and, but the important thing is every one of those persons in that body of Christ will have given up their own will. Mm -hmm. They will be completely subject to the that, will of the Father. That is where the new covenant comes in. The new covenant by the blood of Christ is for those who are called faithful and chosen. And it, it, it is, they are called to a heavenly calling. Once Christ has returned, <laughs> that heavenly calling in the new covenant stops. That new covenant is a calling to heaven, not to earth. We were guaranteed life on earth. God created us to live on earth, not but, in heaven. But he has arrangements just like he had the nation. The nation of Israel was his favorite nation. They were picked from all the nations. God said that. You, you're the only ones I've picked. So he was showing favoritism when he picked what? them. But Why? He, did he did it for the forefathers, for the sake of the forefathers. He said no, that. He did it. He but did it. the main reason he did it is because he put his name on it. Just like he told he told Moses, he says, I'm going to deal with Pharaoh for my namesake. Yeah, and he told them time and time again, you are a stiff-necked people. And Jesus told them, you of your father, the devil. He did. He, he chose Israel because that is the line that his son came through. That is the line that the seed came through. The seed that was argued about in, in, in Genesis chapter 2. I will put enmity between you and the woman between her seed and your seed. You shall bruise him in the heel, but he shall bruise you in the head. Sister Helene, I have to ask you, how's Alan? Uh, I, was, I, I was trying to get in there. Uh, can I just can I just say uh, the Apostle Paul, you know, okay. he was he he was putting this argument across about who was better than who, and he says, uh, it, it, salvation belongs to the Jews, and he says, you know, the law, the covenant, was only a tutor leading to Christ, right. and he says, uh, uh, you know, in the book of John, it says that uh, Jesus, Jesus himself said that I have a, a other sheep which are not of this fold, but they will become one flock. So what I what I what I I enjoyed your 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 share, brother, and uh, you know it, it was complicated for me. And you know, for facts and figures, I wouldn't say God intended for people to get salvation through facts and figures. No disrespect to you. So you know, uh, as Paul said, keep it simple. And the covenant <laughs> was a tutor leading to Christ. And Christ died for all mankind. And it says in Revelation 21 that the new heavens and the new earth, which is uh, whatever form it's going to come, and there was a scripture quoted where uh, the, that God uh, has in store for mankind, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be unthinkable. And he says he couldn't describe it. But uh, to me, that is Revelation 21 verses 4 that there's going to be whatever is in store, but it certainly won't be, you know, a distinction of people, you know, that we've all, uh, Christ is our mediator for, for all mankind. Thank you. Uh, Brother Jeff, I see your hand up, but I think that's still residual, or is that a new comment? I think, no, no, that, I'm sorry, that's that's from previous. So. Residual, okay, no, thank you. But sorry. I have to get back to Helene. I think I may be, be able to hear her now. How's okay, yeah, yes, you can. Thank you. Uh, he's doing quite well. As you know, in the past, there's been some real uh, health issues, but he's doing quite well. And so thank you for asking for that. And just a brief comment on your study. Really appreciate that. And then the comments that the brethren have made, it shows the manifold wisdom of God and how we do have a lot of things to consider, and we're just never going to get bored with God's plan. 
That's a good way to put it. Very good. Thank you. He's he's very he's very uh, he's very varied and got a lot of good things to tell us. We won't get them all. Yeah. Amen, <laughs> sister. Brother, okay. well, we, Jacinto. I said, "Amen, sister." <laughs> oh, yeah. David, oh. do you have a one sentence answer for this? Um, I was just reading in Isaiah about uh, Assyria and Egypt and Israel being partners together in praising God. Uh, and this is like a future prophecy. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, you know, uh, Brother Jeff in his presentation today talked about Ezekiel 38. And I think Assyria from the north represents the northern part of the coalition. Egypt represents the Western world. And I think that between them is Israel. And I, what I kind of think it means is that, uh, this is very interpretive, Lynette, but you know, I never <laughs> shy away from interpretation. But I think it means both blocks that have been involved in this issue, plus Israel, are all going to come to reproachment of the kingdom. Israel is going to be the center, but the blessings are going to go to both blocks. Okay. <laughs> Just a, a suggestion there. Uh, brother. Okay, this has been a... This has been very stimulating, but it's very late for Gus, and we need to be able to get, break him free so he can get some rest for tomorrow. Okay, I, I, Javier, I think you had a comment. I hate to hate to break you off from that. Maybe you can oh, just give it quick. Not at all, Brother Rice. Uh, thank you so much for um, your exposition. Um, I do see things a little bit different when it comes to the New Covenant, but I think that um, we all have freedom of expression, and, and I love to, to hear others' opinions. Um, like the scripture says, iron sharpens iron, so, so the face of uh, a friend. Uh, and uh, I, I think that the Holy Spirit can help us all to um, you know, jumble things out once in a while. And if, if a ball falls down on the ground, well, we still have a lot of stuff left. To, I, I don't need to, ex to know exactly everything that's expressed in the scriptures to, to have faith and, and love for my fellow brothers and, and yeah. faith in God. So thank you so much, brother. Oh, thank you. Appreciate your comment. Thank you, uh, brother Bo. Sorry for the intrusion. Oh, no problem. No, no problem at all. Thank you, David. It was a blessing. Thank you all. Yes, thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Brother David. See you tomorrow. OK. OK, Gus, I guess we can. I'm going to cut Call it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, Good night. Good night all.